there's one thing I really don't understand. It's why people want to pick apart intermittent fasting so much that they are so adamant about saying that it's wrong or finding ways to poke holes in it, when in reality it's like the least dogmatic approach to nutrition that you could possibly have because it works with any kind of dietary strategy. You can be vegan, you can be paleo, you can be whatever, and it's going to work because it's a timing system. But lo and behold, once again, we have a lot of people that are taking this relatively new study, taking bits and pieces from it to create content that makes it sound like intermittent fasting is going to destroy you. It's going to ruin you. It's going to lower your testosterone levels. It's gonna lower your ability to maintain muscle. Let's break this down because that's not exactly what we're looking at. And I will say right out in the open, yes, this study did show a decline in testosterone, but there is a very clear reason as to why, and it's not the end of the world. So what this video is, is a general overview and a pretty nitpicky overview of a study that was published in the journal Medicine and Science in Sports and Exercise. It was published in 2021. And the role of this entire study was to look at intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating or feeding versus a normal diet over the course of 12 months to take a look at levels of muscle mass, fat mass, strength, cardiovascular disease risk, inflammation, things like that. They weren't just trying to build a study to destroy intermittent fasting. What happens is people on the internet like to take little bits and pieces as such and just inflame it a lot. The study was actually quite well crafted and it really looked at a lot of cool things. So the study took a look at 20 subjects, okay? And it divided them into two groups and it looked at them over the course of 12 months. Very simple design, okay? Single blind study. With this, one group did time-restricted feeding, intermittent fasting, where they ate at 1 p.m., 4 p.m., and 8 p.m. The other group was a normal group that ate at 8 a.m., 1 p.m., and 8 p.m., okay? They started out matched for calories, okay? They said, you're gonna eat the same amount of calories roughly, okay? That didn't necessarily stick as time went on, and we'll get to it in a second with the video because this is like the most important piece, but the bottom line is that two simple groups, fasting versus not fasting. Now, the results were pretty interesting. They did find that testosterone levels decreased. They found that IGF-1 levels decrease, which are strong markers for building and maintaining muscle. So at first glance, that's a little bit daunting. But then you also look at the data and you say, well, the larger part of the study that wasn't just looking at those metrics found that there was a decrease in inflammation, a decrease in cardiovascular disease risk. There was increases in adenopectin, increases in autophagy, increases in all these things that were beneficial when it came down to just overall healthy biomarkers. The most important thing to note with this entire study, because this dictates everything, is that a couple of months into the study, the fasting group spontaneously started reducing their caloric intake. So by the time they were two months in, the fasting group was in a deficit, a significant deficit, whereas the normal diet group was actually in a slight, ever so slight surplus. This whole thing, independent of fasting, changes everything. Being in a caloric deficit, fasting or not, changes everything. Everything alters then. Okay, hormones alter, signaling devices alter, testosterone alters, muscle mass changes. It is very important that we note this. In fact, the time-restricted eating group started out at 2760 in terms of calories, 2760 calories, and ended at 2580. Okay, so they had almost a 200 calorie drop in their overall caloric intake, whereas the normal diet group started at 2,942 and ended at 2,978. So the actual normal diet group ended up in a surplus, whereas the fasting group ended up in a deficit. That's not the point of the study, but it is probably the most important thing to note with this. When you have a deficit, all kinds of things happen. Okay, whether it is a caloric deficit from fasting, or a caloric deficit just from reducing calories. You have an increase in what's called adenopectin. Okay, this is secreted by fat cells. You have a decrease in inflammatory signals, decrease in inflammation. You have an increase in what's called HSP27. Okay, you have an increase in autophagy. All these things that can improve your lipid panel, all these things that can improve inflammatory markers, improve your cardiovascular disease risk, improve your body composition, generally speaking, as far as fat is concerned, 
but you're still in a deficit. So yes, you can lose some muscle. Yes, your testosterone levels can drop, but let's dig in a little deeper. So with this study, it was a prerequisite that you had at least five years of resistance training experience because they wanted to have these subjects undergo some training, okay? Which makes sense, right? So what they did is in the beginning, for the first couple of months, they had them do a supervised training protocol. And then after the first couple of months, they said, okay, we need you to go in and train three times per week doing a specific criteria of workout and maintain that. Okay, that way they were all training the same way with their different dietary patterns. Okay, well at the end of the 12 months, they did some stuff. They looked at their fat-free mass and everything like that. So the fasting group, the time-restricted eating group, had a total reduction in like total mass of 3.36%. Okay, that's pretty significant. They had a reduction in fat mass of 11.8%. So they lost a lot of fat as a percentage to their total weight, which is great. That's kind of what we're looking for. But if you're in a deficit, that's gonna happen either way. But if you're fasting, one can make the argument that maybe it happens a little bit faster. Anyhow, with the normal diet group, it was a little more interesting. The normal diet group had an increase in 2.86% of their fat-free mass. So outside of fat, they put on a couple percent of overall weight. So they probably put on maybe some water, maybe some muscle, pretty cool actually. They had a total weight increase of 3.37% of their total weight. So they gained weight, which is not too surprising considering how they were resistance training and the fact that they were in a slight surplus. So you're really comparing apples to oranges here. You're comparing a group that was in a deficit and training and a group that was in a very subtle surplus in training. I'm not a rocket scientist, but I can tell you that that probably would just, I don't know, give you some different outcomes. But here's what's really cool. The time-restricted eating group had an 18% reduction in their visceral adipose tissue, their visceral fat, okay? So that is tremendous. The normal diet group had no change in that whatsoever. We've probably seen from other videos that I've done that intermittent fasting and fasting in general is very, very good when it comes down to visceral fat in particular, okay? That is not the kind of fat you wanna have laying around. That fat leaks inflammatory cytokines. It is not good at all. It is a associated with all kinds of different risk factors otherwise. But then when we start looking at the muscle cross-sectional area, that's where things get a little bit more disturbing. And it actually even had me say, wait a minute, what's going on before I knew the whole deficit thing? Okay, the cross-sectional area of the arm in the fasting group, there was a reduction in over 4%. So they lost over 4% over a course of a year in their actual cross-sectional muscle area of their arm, with their thigh just under 3% in the fasting group. Okay, now in the normal diet group, they had increases. The normal diet group had almost a 12% increase in their arm and almost a 7% increase in their thigh. But here's what's really, really interesting. Again, we know that one's in a deficit, so we don't have to beat that one into the ground, but the fasting group had a 15% increase in their strength with their bench press, and the normal diet group only had a 10% increase in their strength with the bench press. So that's what's interesting. Even in a deficit, the group that was fasting was able to increase strength, which tells me that since they got stronger, when they would go back into a surplus or come back up to maintenance, they might have the potential to build that muscle back and then some even better because they got stronger. Why did they get stronger? Who knows? Maybe it's an inflammation thing. Maybe it's just overall insulin sensitivity. Who knows? There's a number of different things that could play that role. But what do we see out of this, okay? The most important takeaway that you can take from this entire thing, and there's a lot more that we need to talk about still, is that if you are going to practice fasting, try not to get yourself in a deficit if you're trying to maintain or build muscle. Use fasting for what it works for, which is insulin sensitivity, improving uh, body composition as far as fat mass goes and reallocation there, but don't try to just aggressively reduce calories with fasting, or yes, you'll lose muscle just like you would if you were doing a standard diet and reducing calories. It's very, very important. Okay, so we've learned something from this. Try to keep your calories slightly in a deficit if you're trying to lose fat, but for the most part, at maintenance level. Also, don't fast every single day. You don't want to put yourself into the situation where you're just aggressively reducing calories over time. Okay, that is so unbelievably important that we mention that. But the other thing that becomes abundantly, abundantly clear is that protein is really the essential piece that we need whatever we are doing. If we are in a deficit, protein is key because that is going to slow down the catabolic response. So 
we can look at the data here and see, honestly, if you look at this, I don't think they were eating enough protein. I think we could probably get away with eating more within this kind of study design. And I'm a bigger proponent of consuming a little more protein than what they were taking in. So that is so key if you're going to be in a deficit. If you're wanting to maintain muscle in a deficit, protein becomes even more important. I put a link below for what's called ButcherBox. They are a really cool grass-fed, grass-finished beef delivery company. They don't just have beef. They have chicken, they have fish, they have shellfish, scallops, they have chicken thigh, they have brisket, they have everything you would think of. Super high quality delivered to your doorstep. Honestly, their ribeyes are the best ribeyes I've probably ever had. And I've had a lot of really good ribeyes. So that link is down below. So if you're finding ways to get new protein in, finding ways to get your meat in, try and find ways that are gonna, I don't know, spice up your diet a little bit, check them out. And then it's delivered to your doorstep in just a couple of days. Super easy. And if you like scallops, I'm telling you right now, their scallops are some of the best scallops I've ever had as well. So that is right there down below in the description. That is a special link that'll get you access to ButcherBox. They've been a big supporter on this channel for a while. So check them out after this video. Get your hands on some of that. Seriously, it's epic. So now we look at testosterone. <laughs> this is kind of interesting because testosterone and IGF are dramatically influenced by our caloric intake. Okay, so when we look at this, there was something interesting. With the time-restricted eating group, after just a couple of months doing time-restricted eating, there was over a 3% reduction in testosterone already. Okay, but as time went on, that increased even more. They went from about a 3% decrease in testosterone two months into this to about a 16% decrease in testosterone by the end of the 12 months. This is the part that different outlets are having a heyday with. Don't intermittent fast because your testosterone is going to reduce by 16%. It's not, context matters, okay? Deficit matters, okay? But also, let's take a look at the IGF. IGF dropped 14% after two months, but it stayed about 14% at the end of the 12 months. That tells us a lot, because when you're in a deficit, which happened after two months into the study, IGF tends to drop. IGF is pro-growth. If there's not a surplus, IGF is not going to be heavily spiked, right? So as soon as they started going into the deficit, at two months, it went down 14%. And since they didn't go into a deficit any less, stayed at 14% deficit. Testosterone is a different beast, okay? Because what can happen with testosterone is as adenopectin goes up, which is that fat loss sort of hormone that we see that's secreted by the adipocyte, by the fat cell, when adenopectin goes up, a lot of times there's an inverse relationship with adenopectin and what's called leptin. Leptin is a signaling hormone that's associated with satiety and all this stuff. So when leptin goes down and adenopectin goes up, that ratio is different. Leptin plays a significant role in our testosterone levels, which is why when we're in a deficit, it's very normal to see testosterone levels drop because leptin influences and acts upon the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. So it influences the communication. So basically, if you're in a deficit, you're not gonna pump out as much testosterone. It's simple and it's even biological. It doesn't make sense that you would produce more testosterone when you're eating significantly less. Now, we have to also pay very close attention to the fact that testosterone does not always make or break things. Testosterone is important, it is key, okay? But there was a study that was published in the Frontiers in Physiology a while back that I, I love this study, because it demonstrated that testosterone levels didn't really matter in terms of workout recovery and overall even muscle growth. What mattered the most was what is called androgen receptor density. Okay, and that is how an androgen receptor that receives testosterone, how much testosterone it receives. So if you have more receptors to receive those growth hormones and those testosterones and those pieces like that, that is going to be the beneficial effect. So it really is skewed to this bio-individual approach of how much testosterone is good enough for one person or another person. It really does matter. The most important thing that you have to pay attention to is, are you symptomatic of low testosterone? If you have no sex drive, if you can't build muscle, if all these things that are associated with low T, if you're symptomatic, then yes, there's a problem. But I know plenty of people that have 300, 400 level testosterone that act just like a guy that would have six, seven, 800. It doesn't really matter as much what the actual number is, it matters for you, okay? So if you're in a deficit and those numbers go down, it doesn't mean that you can't maintain muscle, okay? But the other thing that we have to pay attention to is when we look at all these other factors, then when calories would come back up the baseline, testosterone would probably come right back up too. It's totally fine if you ask me. Here's the thing that I think is super cool, the insulin sensitivity piece. The time-restricted eating group, two months in, 
had a 28% reduction in insulin resistance. Okay, so a 28% increase in insulin sensitivity. At the end of the 12 months, it went up to 31%, which isn't a huge change from 2%, but still a 31% increase in insulin sensitivity in 12 months. That is huge. That alone can make it so that you will be more responsive to the carbohydrates that you eat and ultimately be able to possibly absorb more protein. The thing I like the most about this is those effects came fast, two months to 28% increase. And then after that, just small little increase to 31% by the end of the year. So just short stents of intermittent fasting could have powerful effects. That is what is super, super cool here. And if you look at what is called HOMA IR, which is really just a measurement of insulin resistance, 37% increase at the end of the year in terms of kind of the uh, lagging indicator for what's called insulin resistance. So the ability to handle carbohydrates or handle glucose. So again, phenomenal things. Now when we get into the lipid panel, this is where it's even cooler. The time-restricted eating group, there is an increase in HDL over 6% at two months in. 6% increase in HDL at just two months. At the end of the year, 15.39% increase. When it came down to LDL, there was about an 8% decrease in LDL in the fasting group. Again, a lot of these things can happen simply by being in a deficit, but I'm going to make the argument that fasting actually has a pretty powerful role just because of the gaps between meals as well. Then the triglyceride piece is really fascinating too. Triglycerides dropped by about 7% after two months and dropped by a whopping 20% by the end of the year. Okay. So we see all these improvements in lipid biomarkers as well. And then we see these final improvements in what are called interleukin sixes and interleukin one beta and tumor necrosis factor alpha. These are inflammatory cytokines that are associated with, well, all kinds of different risk factors. We don't want these cytokines to be elevated. One of the things that we could take away from this is that when inflammation is high, you can make the argument that it's a lot easier to store fat and harder to lose fat. So just by bringing inflammation down, even though we might have sacrificed some muscle, we put ourselves in a great spot to be able to potentially build muscle later on just because inflammatory signaling is down. Now that can change. I mean, as soon as you go into a heavy surplus, inflammation will go up again. But I think we are putting the cart before the horse by freaking out because there's a small amount of muscle loss and a small amount of a decrease in testosterone, actually a rather modest amount uh, decrease in testosterone. But we can't take that and just run to the bank with it. We have to look at the holistic picture and we have to look at cardio vascular disease risk, inflammation, and all this, and I'd be willing to sacrifice a little bit of muscle to be able to play that whole role together. However, if we were eating at baseline and at eucaloric the same amount of time through the whole study, I think we would have seen a dramatically different result either way. But now you have an explanation. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel, and I'll see you tomorrow.